the Computer Conservation Society welcomes you to South Kensington in London, England, where an exciting new venture is unfolding in the Science Museum to record the history of computing and to restore some early computers back to full working order. In the evocative setting of the Science Museum of London, the Computer Conservation Society presents to you a unique seminar on design decisions on early computers, or why we did what we did. This took place on the 24th of May, 1990, in the museum's lecture theatre. Maurice Wilkes talks about EDSAC. John Pinkerton describes how he evolved Leo from EDSAC. Tom Kilburn describes the Manchester prototype and Mark I. And Donald Davis and David Clayton described a pilot ace. Each talk lasts 30 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of discussion. A general discussion rounds off the seminar. The seminar chairman is Tony Sale, who is also secretary to the Computer Conservation Society. So, without more ado, um, I would like to invite uh, Professor Morris Wilkes to. Um, the first remark I should make is that at the time I'm going to speak of, the world was in a very abnormal situation. When I came back from the United States, in uh, August or September 1946, having found out pretty completely what was going on there, the Second World War uh, had ended only a little more than a year ago. And so everything was in a sort of chaos. But on the other hand, there was an enormous spirit of reconstruction. Uh, and I found myself in charge of the computer lab, then called the mathematical lab, in Cambridge, written into my terms of reference were to develop methods of computing and computing uh, machinery. Uh, and uh, the first strings at that time were relatively open. Uh, the university, like other institutions, wanted to get things going again. So I didn't have to ask anybody. I could build a computer, please. I didn't have to put up any proposal. I didn't have to arrange any budget. Uh, I was in charge, and I could go ahead. And I said, <laughs> were extremely abnormal. <laughs> uh, moreover, I uh, had uh, inherited a building with some analog equipment in it, and desk machines, but no staff, and so I had begun to build it up, and everybody I appointed, um, uh, I, I appointed everybody. I was the only one who knew anything about building computers, and so if I said, you build a computer this way, they said, yes, right, that's the way. Uh, and so if I say, the first personal pronoun comes into this, uh, I decided this and I decided that, that in fact is the case uh, for the reason of these very, uh, this very anomalous situation. Um, the one in Gabriel Fess Hartley, who uh, knew a good deal about, uh, uh, before I did, knew about what was going on in the United States, but his... Um, uh, qualifications were more on the mathematical side, and he became a great tower of strength when the thing was working. And indeed then, when we started to do the software and so on, uh, the situation was entirely different. And, uh, their students had grown up in the lab then, or David Wheeler in particular, uh, and it was a much more normal situation. Uh, uh, Rennick, uh, Bill Rennick joined me in March 47, and it was some time before he got up to speed, because I had to tell him what computers were. Uh, and uh, he was involved, of course, in some of the um, uh, details of, of the implementation. Now, uh, I'd like to discuss uh, design, design decisions under three headings. There's policy, that is decisions about how you take decisions, there are architectural decisions and there are implementation decisions. Now, I was perfectly clear in my own mind about policy. It was not 
a project to build a computer only. It was a project to build a computer, to, ex to learn how to use it, uh, and then to solve some problems. Uh, it was to be in the nature of a crash program. Now, this was a war tank term. When a new radar equipment was developed, uh, steps were taken to put it into production. But in parallel with that, one or more pr crash programs were normally established in order to get some equipment for deployment at the earliest possible moment. Uh, all corners cut. And I viewed the EDSAC uh, project in that um, uh, nature. Uh, the machine was to be simple with no frills, uh, except it was to be comfortable to use. I didn't want it to be a sort of machine in which the user had to know about pulses inside it or timing or anything of that sort. There was to be no attempt fully to exploit the technology, <coughs> provided it would run and uh, do programs, that was enough. Uh, moreover, there was no attempt to optimize the implementation. It was a rule that if something was made to work, a circuit for some part of the machine was made to work, it was accepted. It worked with, uh, with adequate margin, with good margin, that was consistent on. It was accepted. There was no attempt to make something that would be more economical uh, or more elegant. The architectural decisions, and uh, some of these I took very early, I began to think about this project on my way back from the States in the Queen Mary. There was no real decision to be taken about the memory. The only memory that you felt you could go ahead with was the mercury memory. Not that anybody ever made one, but it all seemed good classical physics. No electrons or anything. <laughs> uh, 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 I was aware there were a number of projects for um, uh, research in memory, uh, particularly the one that um, uh, F.C. Williams and Tom Kilman here were, were concerned with at TRE and then uh, later at Manchester University. But this my project was not to be a project on, on memory development, to build a computer. Uh, the mercury, uh, mercury memory was a serial memory, and that seemed to lead uh, to, to a serial machine. And anyway, I was under the impression that a serial machine was a lot simpler than a parallel machine. I think I was wrong in that, but that was, that, that was what I thought. Uh, it was to be a fixed point machine. There were floating point relay machines, but no, none of us uh, could face it electronically. Uh, and even the, the people who uh, were trying to build uh, very much uh, higher class machines <coughs> than mine, uh, they didn't build floating point either until much later in the game. Um, <laughs> so it was to be a fixed point, a question of how negative numbers were to be represented. Uh, there were three possibilities. The one we went for was the one that is popular now, namely two's complements. Uh, but also, uh, you, uh, it was suggested that other people favored a sine plus modulus, uh, and some people even favored the one's complement system, in which you got the, uh, the, the you made a number negative by replacing each digit in it. Uh, by its inverse, noughts into ones, ones into noughts. Uh, th those, both those um, two <coughs> latter systems are a bit awkward. They involve you, for, for example, with two zeros, plus zeros and minus zero, <coughs> like them. So we went ahead for, uh, after due consideration, with <laughs> <laughs> how How long was the word to be? Well, I reasoned as follows. Uh, 10 decimal accuracy is about what you want. Uh, that's 34 binary digits. Add one to a sign, it makes 35. Add another one for a space between words, and you get 36. And this was really rather nice, because half that is 18, not one off the space, 17, and 17 bits, it turned out, were just about right for an instruction. Uh, two instructions, that was to say, per word. So 36 bit word. Uh, I knew we were going to be short of memory. And I thought, as we've got to have uh, circuits for dealing with half words for instructions, we might as well uh, make half words available for numbers. 
uh, I felt that uh, many numbers could be represented to half word accuracy, and this would uh, make the best of the small amount of memory we were going to have. And so we did that. Uh, the memory was addressed by half words. So if you wanted a full word, a long word, then you had its address was even. None of this left and right business that appeared in, in some machines. Another decision, the position of the binary point. Uh, now, uh, if, the, if all numbers are fractions in a twos complement machine, numbers lie within the range minus 1, less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 1. That is to say, minus 1 is attainable, but plus 1 is not. I pondered over this and thought it might be rather awkward not to be able to have uh, 1. It's a number of that come frequently into calculation. <laughs> <laughs> and so there was a scheme for a time of having numbers in the range minus 2, less than or equal to x, less than 2. Now, it would have been an awkward thing. I, I'm not quite sure how it happened that we didn't. I used to like to say that when the arithmetic unit was built, it turned out that the numbers were in the uh, right range, minus 1, less than equal to x, less than 1. And there may be some truth in that. Anyway, uh, it was quite uh, uh, after fairly late in the uh, design process, it was um, we realized that uh, it would be better to have minus 1, less than equal to x, less than 1. Uh, input and output, uh, I decided to go for paper tape for input and a directly coupled teleprinter for the output. The alternative was uh, punched card, use of punch cards. I uh, think I felt that punch card equipment would be more complex, it would be more to build. Also, it would have involved negotiation with manufacturers of such machinery, uh, whereas anybody could buy uh, teleprinter equipment. And so we decided, I decided, uh, teleprinter equipment. Um, there was um, one or two things about it. For example, on input, one of the bits was reversed so that uh, blank uh, tape didn't mean it. Now, uh, the instruction set uh, followed naturally, I think, a single instruction, uh, sorry, single address instruction set followed naturally from the serial architecture. And I don't know whether any of you have looked at that paper about the EDSAC uh, that uh, Tony Taylor sent around. If you haven't, if you look at it afterwards, then it will add some details to the things I'm seeing. Uh, a serial machine, uh, it's easy in a serial machine to make the accumulator double length. That is to say, if two numbers were multiplied together, then uh, the, the, all the bits, the double length result, went into the accumulator and ad was added to what was there. The the way the programmer did it was to load a register called the multiplier register with a multiplier and then use a multiply instruction to bring from memory another number and then the multiplication was performed by uh, hardwired uh, logic. The beauty of this arrangement is that you can accumulate a scalar product uh, with complete accuracy and do the rounding off at the very end. <coughs> and I had some exposure to numerical analysis. I realized that the most important thing you ever do in numerical analysis is rounding off. And therefore, we did it properly. We had an instruction for rounding off. It added one uh, in uh, place in the accumulator just to the right of the least significant bit. Uh, we did cut a corner over the shift instruction. Uh, the obvious way to do the shift instruction was to have a lock code that said left or right. 
And then in the address part of the instruction to have a number, for example, the number five came, there would be a shift of five places. Now the hardware was designed so that the shifts were at one place at a time. And to get a, a shift of five, there would need there needed to be five shifts and a counter uh, to count uh, that the right number, in this case five, uh, had been done. I didn't want to build a counter. I wanted to save the equipment. And I therefore uh, decided that instead of having the number pack, the amount of shifting would be determined by the position of a one in the instruction field. There was a single one in the, sorry, in the, I beg your pardon, in the address field. There was a single one. If that one was in the least significant place, shift of one place. If that one were in the uh, next most significant place, shift of two. If it were uh, three along, shift of three, and so on. Uh, that simplified the hardware. It meant you couldn't do a shift of more than 12 with a single instruction. And if you wanted to do more than 12, you had to have two instructions. Well, now, I believe this it may have saved us a few weeks in the construction. It was horribly inelegant, an absolute pest. Uh, but there it was. I, looking back, I like to think that perhaps I ought to have spent a little more time seeing whether there wasn't some cute way of doing it. Uh, but in fact, I didn't. And that was how it was done. And that was why it was done that way. Another thing some people put on very peculiar. Uh, many machines that were being designed at that time on these principles uh, had an add instruction which would add a number into the accumulator, add it to what was there. But they also had a clear and add instruction that would first clear the accumulator and then uh, insert the new number. Uh, and they would have a, a, a subtract and a clear and subtract. Well, I thought you could get away, you could save an instruction by doing it another way. Uh, to have two transfer operations that would copy the number in the accumulator to memory, uh, one of those would uh, leave the number where it was, and the other would clear the accumulator. And so we cleared our accumulator on uh, transfer out. I got a good deal of flack for this. Uh, Mr. Spacey in particular uh, said that, that Bull Wilkes has done it in a damn silly way, or to turn that into a Manchester, the obvious way. Uh, but nevertheless, that was why I did it. I thought possibly I might have been weak or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, oh yes, another thing about the instruction set one, I do think we did the input and output rather elegantly. The input operation would read a row of holes, a single row of holes on the tape, and put the resulting five bits <coughs> into memory. And an output instruction would take five bits from memory uh, and uh, send them to the teleprinter where they would be printed right. as a character. Uh, there was one row of holes at a time. Uh, we might have, have gone through the accumulator instead of through the memory, but that wouldn't have made very much difference. I think it was a nice, neat way of doing it. There was no hardware for reading, say, uh, the whole word from the tape. It would be several rows. Uh, well, now, coming on, uh, sorry to rush you through all these design, design decisions. Some of them, as you gather, uh, uh, took them took themselves <coughs> before I was too ignorant to realize big decision was being taken, uh, and uh, partly because the nature of the circumstances uh, dictated a certain way. Others did require quite a lot of thought. But now let me come to implementation <coughs> decisions. It had to be a mercury memory. I had an enormous stroke of luck in that I met Tommy Gold, who gave me a design for a mercury tank that he had uh, evolved known about when he was working with the Admiralty during the war. It had not been used for a digital memory, it had been used for something else in radar. But anyway, there it was, and the tank and it worked. I built a single one, a single tank to his specification. Oh, we used to say tank instead of uh, tube for these mercury tanks, in order to avoid confusion with a vacuum tube, uh, which uh, in, uh, uh, other countries will want valve to call it. Now, uh, the, uh, uh, 
we ought to have 32 tanks in the end, and they all had to be exactly the same length within a very close tolerance, obviously. Moreover, the crystals had to be aligned very accurately. The crystal was about half an inch across, and that is an enormous number of wavelengths of sound in mercury at 13.5 megacycles. And so the beam that comes off the crystal is a very, very sharp one, and it has to hit the crystal at the other end. The walls of the tube are not there to guide the sound as it goes down. And that keeps mercury in. <laughs> and he, uh, the, the beam of sound is very sharply pointed and uh, uh, doesn't touch the walls at all. Uh, you need an accuracy of, some, of the order of minutes of arc, a few minutes of arc. Uh, well, now, one way of doing this was to uh, make the tanks with adjustment screws so that you would adjust the tanks to be all of the same length and adjust the inclination of the crystal. Uh, so that uh, the beam uh, hit it off. Uh, I didn't want to do it that way. I thought it would be very much nicer to build these tanks in batteries of 16, to design the battery carefully, uh, have it made with sufficient precision so that when it was all bolted up solid, then everything was in line and the crystals were the right distance apart. Uh, and I did that, I designed it myself on a drawing board, I worked out the stresses, because when you pulled it up, there were a lot of rubber washers that got compressed. And I was very fortunate in that the superintendent of the central workshops in the Engineering Department uh, was, was very much liked that sort of job. And he had, uh, it was a challenge, but not a, not a desperate challenge for him to meet the tolerances. And nevertheless, I must say, I was very relieved uh, when we had a battery and filled it and all the tanks were safely. I suppose it was a certain amount of risk, but I'm sure it was a, it was a good way to do it. The uh, uh, registers in the arithmetic unit, the accumulator, for example, uh, and uh, the multiplier register, registers for holding the instruction while it was being executed, uh, they were all short mercury tanks. The, the main tanks were uh, about five feet long. The short ones were an inch and a half long. And then there was the question to be decided about uh, logic, how the switching was to be done. Now, an obvious <coughs> way was to use pen nodes and to use the control grid and the suppressor grid, this is described in uh, uh, Tony Sale's document. Uh, uh, use the control grid and the suppressor uh, to do switching, for putting uh, signals on each. Well, now, I did a few experiments with this, and it didn't, uh, it didn't seem very nice. Uh, the suppressor grid uh, needed a much bigger swing than the control grid that made it horribly unbalanced, and it was all, I thought, pretty messy. And I was talking about this one day to someone in the Cavendish, I think his name was Popo, and he said, why didn't you use diode switches? I told him what I meant. And that was what we did. <coughs> uh, we used uh, diode switches, these were thermionic diodes, little ones. Uh, they were driven by uh, cathode followers, the incoming signal was driven by cathode followers, it was a pull-up resistor, and the output was put into an amplifier. And I was very, very proud of my discovery after quite a lot of experiment work that the ideal sort of amplifier for that purpose was a cathode coupled amplifier. And if I had longer, I would like to give you a little lecture on why it was so good. <laughs> it made a lot of difference. But it was a fairly expensive business to gauge. You see, there were the incoming colors, or maybe they were in the uh, chassis from which the signals were. were connected with the source, there was this um, cathode coupled amplifier which involved two vacuum tubes, uh, and that drove the cathode father to the back of the key. The machine was AC coupled, and extensive use was made of DC restoring diodes to bring the level, uh, keep the level, the baseline, in a fixed position. And I soon discovered that there could be no compromise about that. But to put these things everywhere. 
make sure they worked. It was also necessary to make sure that in between the pulses, the waveform came down to zero. No between one pulse running into another in Adam's land. The pulse had to come down and remain down at appreciable time at zero before it went up uh, for the next pulse. Now, this was much helped by a decision that I ought to have mentioned right at the beginning. In order to make the implementation job easier, and therefore reach earlier the point at which we could start working on programming, I decided that it would run uh, at half a megacycle a second instead of one megacycle a second. Now, any electronic engineer works thought would take the challenge of working at at least one megacycle. All my colleagues and competitors did the same, uh, building this kind of machine. But I think we bought a great deal by making that uh, decision. And it certainly made this question of getting the nice clean pulses with proper space in between them. It certainly made that uh, very much easier. Of course, uh, one could give a whole lecture on things we might have done. We used balance waveforms, partly balance waveforms, all sorts of things. But that was what we did, and I told you why we did it. Uh, now, uh, in a serial machine, a synchronous serial machine, uh, uh, every now and then you reach the point at which it is necessary to synchronize the pulses and reshape them. And that is done by slipping uh, a pulse interval. You must delay the incoming pulses by nearly a pulse interval and use uh, that delayed waveform to gate a cleanly generated top pulse. And for that purpose, uh, that delay purpose, uh, we used uh, electromagnetic delay lines. I think they had about four sections in them, uh, wave bound on a like tube. Um, <coughs> on the mechanical design, well, let me say what I didn't do. I didn't use 19 inch racks. Never liked 19 inch racks. Why something that appeals to people who design telephones should have exercised such a grip on the electronic system? <laughs> <laughs> never been able to understand. And so we had a long chassis, about that long. They were bent in a strange way, uh, but they, they were really very good. They made them very accessible and uh, uh, worked out very nicely. Uh, each chassis had a heater transformer on it. The units, the chassis, were wired in, not plugged in. I suppose I was a bit scared of plugs, which in those days had a bad name, a uh, bad context, I think perhaps it was unfairly. Uh, but also I was afraid of the capacity that there would be on the signal wires. And in fact, these chassis were soldered in. The signal wires that ran around the machine were just open wires that um, just uh, looped across and soldered on the uh, tanks. Uh, on the chassis, all very simple and uh, quite effective. Well, I really, I, I just about uh, finished the end of my time. Oh, I have another five minutes. Well, in that case, I didn't have time. I can say something about the mechanical equipment. This was quite a struggle in there. <laughs> uh, getting mechanical equipment that was reliable and learning how to connect it to electronic devices. You see, there's an enormous speed gap between the speed with which electronic circuits work and mechanical speed. And so there was a snag in that, in connecting them together. Uh, I believe that, uh, this is a, uh, an observation, that one of the things, one of the quite important things that the computer industry has done for the world is to improve, out of all recognition, the quality uh, of mechanical equipment, standing up to hard uh, load loading and interacting with uh, electronic <coughs> devices. 
I only wish to design people who design elevators for buildings. Uh, you can watch it, I want to do that. <laughs> now, as I said, we use teleprinters uh, for the teleprinter for the output, and it was directly connected. And I had, I realized, because of my numerical experience, that some sort of checking was desirable. While the numbers were still in the computer, then the programmer could program numerical checks if he thought they were necessary. But uh, once the thing had been sent to the printer, you'd lost it. And so I provided for a number that was about to be printed from the teleprinter to be read back for checking. This was possible with the Creed teleprinters that we used because the printer had storage for one character. It was printing one behind. So you could read back the thing that was about to be printed. This meant some, some very tricky modifications to the teleprinters. Fortunately, I had a well-equipped workshop and some very able instrument makers. And so uh, that was done. Uh, on the input side, we used mechanical uh, tape readers. Uh, again, uh, the teleprinter, teleprinter type, and we modified them uh, to make it possible to read in parallel. Wasn't long before we went to photoelectric uh, readers. Now, this was all a bit messy because this modified teleprinter ran more slowly than the proper teleprinter. There was only one copy, and it was a printed copy. And we changed the thing uh, later on uh, so that the output was onto paper tape. And we solved the error problem by a, a logical method. No question of reading back. But we made use of the fact that if you take the combinations of five digits in which there are two ones and three zeros, you find there are exactly 10. So you can represent the 10 digits in that two out of five code. And it needs a double <coughs> er error to turn one a digit into another digit. And uh, later on, we went to that, uh, that system. Uh, we could then run um, uh, use punches that ran at much higher speed, uh, and everything was much nicer. I very much wish I had thought of that in the early days. So if I had my time again, I would certainly have thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> accepted teleprinters as they were and used them uh, similarly. Nevertheless, uh, it, uh, it, it did in fact work, and I've given you the reasons uh, why the decisions were taken.
which the initial was then translated into the binary. Yes. Uh, a lot of people didn't do that. No, they didn't. No. Of course, that in a way came later, you see. When I said we got the input right, uh, one of the things I had in mind was that this handling a single row of holes as a unit enabled that kind of thing to be done. Right? It was a, a later program decision. I to do it that way. John Brooks, could you say something about the uh, influences on the design, both from your visit to America and also from the work that was done in this country during the war on, on for example, philosophy? Oh, well, in last classes, that is very easily said. I knew nothing whatever about it. Uh, they were a bit secretive, those guys. Uh, but from what I've heard since, it would not have been. The thing worked at 50 kilometers. And from the engineering point of view, it was all the difference between that. And that one. Uh, of course, the uh, going to the motor, getting the ideas uh, that um, made the whole thing possible. Uh, the, this, most of the decisions I was talking about, the important ones, were taken long before uh, I was in contact with any other groups in this country. Uh, and of course, it's the nature of a project of this sort. Once you start it launched, you can't use other people's ideas because they, they've got different design decisions. <laughs> uh, well, one thing I should have mentioned was that uh, there was one order I call them orders, instructions, you'd say that, uh, was a logical order. And it was, in fact, an AND instruction. It would uh, form the, the AND of a word from memory with the word in the multiplier register. That is to say, uh, bit by bit AND. Well, uh, it's a sign of my ignorance, and I think puts into perspective of, well, anyway, I didn't even know that it was called and, and I invented this word for late. I was entirely innocent of um, formal logic at that time in my career. And that, so that shows how little I was influenced, really, by people like von Neumann and Turing, who seemed to have some sort of idea that an electronic computer was an extension of formal logic. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Robert, for full display right here at the session. Um, now, um, I'll ask uh, John Pinkerton to uh, come and tell us how we design the results here yeah. upon the <coughs> headset. Well, these are all the daunting things that have to follow, Morris. But uh, we did follow Morris at the very beginning, and that was uh, perhaps our salvation. And one of the philosophies that we adopted was we wouldn't change anything at all we didn't understand the reason why it was done the way it was in the beginning that seems to be a pretty good idea uh, I've got a, a few overheads and I also got some slides um, so I'll just make sure everything comes up <coughs> <coughs> you can't reach this thing unless you <laughs> say something about, rather quickly about the personalities of some of the <coughs> people, and I shall show you some pictures of what they look like, and then I will focus on Leo 1, because there are more, there was more than one Leo, there was Leo Mark 2 and Leo Mark 3, and there are some charts here which record the details of them, which you can pick up if you want to afterwards. I'm not going to say anything about the later versions of Leo, but I do want it to be clear that Leo 1 was a unique machine, and there were others uh, made in rather larger numbers which followed it. Now, um, the background of Lyons is the next point, that uh, Lyons was, a firm which uh, was allowed itself to be influenced by ideas to a much greater extent than most businesses. And before the war, at least, it had an incredible reputation for efficiency and reliability of its uh, services. Uh, the office, in particular, had become uh, the subject of great progress um, under the influence of a very uh, remarkable man called John Simmons who joined Lyons from Cambridge directly in 1922 
who was in fact the 11th Wrangler in the mathematics strike boss in 1922. And uh, he had a very powerful mind and a very powerful personality. I'd like to show some pictures of some of these people. And uh, let me see if the first slide will come up the right way round. This is a picture of uh, Mr. John Simmons. Uh, I think if I press the buttons, it should work. But my difficulty usually with these things is the print on them is so small. I <laughs> can't actually see what the devil they do. That's just forward.
Uh, if that were done by program instructions in the manner that the being developed at Cambridge, it would have taken about 90% of the total time. And that was much longer than lines were prepared to spend on it. Uh, also, there was a tremendous lot of input to feed and a lot of output to record, and we didn't want to have uh, any way of slowing, uh, we didn't want to slow the machine down by having to wait for mechanisms to do things. So that was our initial conception of the problem, that there would be considerable unreliability from the use of valves. But here I think I'd take a slightly different line from turning into notes. We found that valves were unreliable from two causes. One is that they suffered from interelectrode and insulation troubles and so on. But I think the major cause of trouble, and a few ex-Leo colleagues here can confirm or correct me on this, is that their emission gradually declined. And after a while, they lost enough in emission so that they didn't function in the circuits properly. You had to throw them away. That meant that uh, you took special measures to deal with that. Now, let's focus on uh, the first approach to the problem of input and output was this, that we would have multiple input and multiple output channels and they would be buffered. So that instead of feeding one character at a time, we would feed uh, not just one number, but a whole group of numbers uh, at one time. We would hold them in a long delay line, which would act as an input buffer. In fact, we had double buffers on the input um, in order to give um, the possibility of filling one buffer from whatever kind of reading device we were going to use, while the other one was ready full to be pulled into the machine in, in a hurry. It went straight into the store. We also looked at this conversion and reconversion problem, and we were frightened by it, um, frankly. We didn't see how to do it, and we thought the answer was to do it by some external means in the input and output channel. Now, it happened that at, the, at this time, the Vans just bought a telephone exchange from STC. It wasn't connected to British Telecom's lines or GPO lines at the time, but it was a very good internal automatic telephone exchange. So STC had a very good reputation with Lions, and they got in touch with STC and said, do you think you could find some way in your research of constructing external converters and reconverters to change numbers from decimal or sterling, incidentally, into binary and vice versa? And it happened there, there was a very experienced switching engineer, a man of great personal charm, as well as being a very clever engineer, a man called Esmond Wright, EPG Wright, um, who got on extraordinarily well with Raymond Thompson. And within a matter of almost weeks, they had worked out how to design the logic of converters <coughs> and reconverters using a kind of circuit technology known as the gas trigger tube. I'll show you some pictures of these in a minute. And they were all very well, but it turned out they were extremely unreliable. However, um, I would like to show you, before we get too far into that, I would like to show you <coughs> some pictures of what Leo actually looked like in its final form, because the, the, the final form <coughs> took a little while to evolve. So I think the next thing is to turn this off again and have the next <coughs> slides. picture shows you what the room, I seem to put it on back to front, I'm sorry about that, I'm not familiar with this projector, but I'm not involved in getting it right around. Um, it shows you that it took up a large part of, of a fairly large room. You can see the, the big racks at the back here. There were four rows of these racks, and there were five racks in each row, and each rack had 12 units in it. Put it at the back here was this enormous power supply, and on this side of the room, um, we should really be over here, uh, there were a number of paper tape punches, two tablets, <coughs> two paper tape punches, and three paper tape readers. Uh, sorry, a bunch of card readers. These are bunch of card readers. Uh, and then there were a couple of paper tape readers on there. Everything was duplicated because we were frightened of the liability of any decent mechanics. That shows you some of the racks closer to. Uh, you see in this case the units are mounted horizontally as they were in EDSEC and the uh, component side was 
accessible, very accessible. The valves all stuck out into an air duct <coughs> on the other side. And when you put the covers on, the, the air was forced to pass the valves to keep cold and cool. And that is the control desk, which again I see I've got in back to front, it doesn't matter. Uh, it had a lot of cathode ray tubes on it, so you could observe what was in the registers, you could observe what was in the store, and the store monitor, which um, became something of an addiction for the programmers. And there was a fairly substantial um, set of marginal testing arrangements, which I'll come to later on. But, but one of the panels in there was the marginal test panel, where we could buy test voltages to many of the circuits in the machine. Uh, that shows you a storage unit with a short delay tube sitting in front of it. <coughs> storage unit was really a replica of the, using slightly different valves than the ones that were designed for the ESA. And that shows you um, some storage batteries which were built onto the same pattern as Morris's. We did actually do the stress calculations over again. We came to the conclusion we ought to use a thicker <coughs> end plate. I think Morris's were an inch. <coughs> Possibly we used harder rubber washers. <coughs> anyway, they also worked perfectly satisfactorily and went on working for very many years after being built without any alteration. So we're very proud of our ultrasonic engineering in those things. And you can see there were quite a lot of short delay tubes because they were used in the production process as well. That shows you um, a teleprinter modified in the way that Morris describes it had a set of five magnets on the top, so the five character elements were individually operated upon to each separate magnet. This shows you a homemade photoelectric technique, which was fairly unsatisfactory as it turned out, because it had 15 glass surfaces which all got slightly dirty, and after about a fortnight we had to clean them all to make it work properly. We soon realized that Ferrante had got the right idea, they made a paper tape reader, which was like a pinhole camera, hadn't got any glass surfaces on it, and that on the bottom on the one hand on the Electric cell on the other hand, and that was much better at the size being very much faster. Well, I think that that's probably the last, that's the last side of that little sequence. So I would like to show you now the kind of logical arrangement which we had got uh, when we um, set it up with these converters and reconverters. This is taken from a, a, a paper published earlier, and it shows you the main arithmetic unit in the store, the buffers in each of the input channels, which were all valve circuits and mercury delay lines, they had little short tubes which assembled individual numbers and put them into position in here, one after the other, until we filled it up. Same thing on the output side. Um, some of these buffers were doubled on the input, but uh, the buffers on the output were not doubled, as far as I can remember. And the logic would have allowed you to have four input channels and four output channels. So we only ever built three in and two out. Um, between the things which are going to read the data, which were, was going to be recorded on a magnetic tape of a, of a special design, which I'll show you some pictures of in a minute, uh, were these gas tube converters. And on the output side, there were these gas tube reconverters, which were really quite sophisticated bits of equipment, because they had a kind of output instruction which told them how to compose the number. It said, convert to the following number of decimal places or convert to the following number of sterling places and suppress the non-significant zeros and so on. So that it, it was a way of composing the complete line on, on the output, which was going to be recorded on these tape decks. Here, the whole thing was, these tape decks were going to run quite a bit faster than ordinary teleprinter speed. In fact, at 20 times teleprinter speed, uh, these were going to run at six and a half times, I think it was, teleprinter speed. Quite why those numbers were chosen, I can't now say, but uh, that was probably to reflect the fact that there was something like three times as much output as there was input, according to our assessment. We did an assessment of the amount of data that would have to be fed in and out based on some program material which David Wheeler had contributed to in 1948. The program was never run, but at least an analysis had been done of a payroll program which showed how much data was likely to be involved. And in fact, there's a published paper which gives you the details of that if anybody wants to do this up. So that is the picture. Well, we got all this organized and the design seems to be very satisfactory, but it was, had a rather sad history. Turn that off now.
I think we use something like a thousand diodes to make the diode matrices. Reconversion is obviously an end of division, and provided you store the equivalence of the, de the sterling numbers, uh, you can do sterling conversion in the same way. So we have alternative instructions of do sterling or decimal conversion. Uh, that was a completely satisfactory answer. We still had to deal with the question of the great volumes of data that would be needed to be fed in and the great volumes of results. Um, so in this case, we decided to be very conservative rather than innovative as we thought in the case of the SDC tape decks. But we took everything that the SDC said they would do on trust, which was obviously rather silly. We should have been more skeptical, but we were not. Uh, so we decided we would use punch card equipment. Uh, we would go to tabulator machine company as it then was, we bought a couple of tabulators of a rather peculiar design which had what they called pence bars in every position, that is to say they would print the numbers from 0 to 11 in every position across the line. We coupled those to the machine and we could print using a 35-bit word on 35 uh, columns at a time and we had a switch over so we could then print on another 35 columns so you could either duplicate what was on one side of the paper from the other, or you could print something differently before you move the paper up. So in fact, we had a very powerful system of input and output using punched cards and punched uh, uh, tabulators, but we retained paper tape. And the Lyons idea was there were three kinds of input, what they call current data, which was what had happened this week, if you like, on the payroll, brought forward data, which was what had happened last week, which had to be fed in again, last week and permanent data which was data that didn't change very much it was convenient to have it on a separate pack of cards so you had the current data on paper tape you had the brought forward data on punch cards you had the uh, permanent data on punch cards and of course all these three channels of data had to be kept in step so the appropriate uh, data for the same individual on the payroll was coordinated but that did not prove to be too serious a problem so we went back to classical peripherals, we abandoned the gas tubes, and we still had this problem of unreliability due to valves to deal with. And I'd like to give you a, show you a, a picture of what the logic looked like when we'd done that, and then um, discuss how we came to deal with the unreliability as best we could. Um, you see the buffering arrangements stayed the same, Converters have disappeared because they've now dealt with inside the machine by convert and reconvert instructions, which in this case took up about 10% of the total time, which was perfectly acceptable, uh, rather than being 90% of it. Um, and we had two paper tape readers, either of which could feed through here, um, which is a double buffer, and three punch card readers, any two of which we could use at the time that we switched through those two channels. So normally, one of them would be reading the um, forward data, another would be reading the permanent data, like people's names and addresses if they were involved. In other details about people who didn't change from week to week. On the output side, two line printers, one of which could be being maintained, and two card punches, again, one of which could be maintained. And that was because we had this uh, phobia about the reliability of, of input and output machinery. And it turned out, actually, it was quite a good idea because we found that as soon as the punch card machine had been maintained, it was more unreliable than it had been before. <laughs> but it did on the whole. In the long run, it was better to have it maintained than not. Well, that was the story on the, uh, how we dealt with input and output. We uh, got the performance we wanted. We got to the stage where you could do um, payroll more or less at the cadence speed of the printer, which is 100 lines a minute. And you devoted two lines to each man, so you were doing about 50 men's payroll per minute, which, considering the machine was so slow, was not bad. And the rhythm of that machine running is something I can still hear in my head. It's just clanking away day and night, uh, and so turning out payroll and other uh, jobs. But it's not the point of the problem to talk to tell you about the jobs. Now the reliability question. Well, as there are certain things you can do about reliability in the design. There are certain things you can do about the 
in maintenance to offset the inherent unreliability, and there are certain things you can do about it in operating. I think those, all those three things have to be considered. In the design, you underrun uh, all your components, and where you needed a, a quarter watt resistor, we used a half watt, and that sort of thing. We underrun the valves, heaters by about 10%, because somebody told us I'm aware of right or not, I don't know the cathode to probably last longer if that happened. We brought the heaters up very slowly and took them down very slowly over about a minute with a special kind of variable transformer which we bought. And uh, generally speaking, everything was kept under as close control as possible. Oh, incidentally, we used uh, anti-parasitic grid stoppers in every valve, and we were really a bit fanatical about interference. Um, we did actually suspect we were going to get a lot of trouble from interference from the punch card equipment, which is full of contacts that open and close large currents in inductive circuits. So every contact had to have spark suppression uh, put into it to make sure there wasn't any electrical interference. And we had a certain amount of trouble with electrical interference from the fluorescent lights at the start, because obviously in a cathode, in an ultrasonic store, you have signals down by one millivolt, and uh, that means that if you aren't careful, you can get interference into the store. But uh, we were a bit obsessive about it, and our attitude was it was cheaper to take precautions than to find out whether they were actually necessary or not. So any precaution you could think of, we took. Um, the maintenance of valves, uh, we took a lot of steps to check that valves were in good shape. We maintained them by every valve being numbered, and regular intervals each valve was taken out and had its uh, neutral conductance checked, and its uh, interelectrode insulation checked, and various other things were done. Uh, in operating, then again, you had to work on the assumption that the machine was probably going to break down. It had a mean time between failures of, I suppose, about between six and ten hours or something like that, order. Uh, that would be my mental recollection. And, and that meant that you had a fairly good sporting chance you're going to have a failure during your job. So you couldn't afford to run a job which might take, say, two hours without having some restart of the facilities in the middle. Of the phrase checkpointing hadn't been invented, but that's what we did. We took departmental totals or other totals out at regular intervals. So if the machine showed there had been an error or it stopped or broke down in any way, then instead of having to go back to the beginning, you went back to the last point at which numbers had been discharged. And that was left to the operator. There was no uh, operating system, of course, possible. In fact, nobody had heard of an operating system. Such a thing uh, wasn't spoken about. No such thing. Oh, no, sorry, there's one more slide. Just, I'm now nearly finished, and what I'm going to say now are some conclusions which I think very much echo what Morris had said. Um, the thing was very unreliable, but it was effective because we took these steps to offset the unreliability and to work through it, so to speak. I think it laid the foundations for data processing, quite honestly, and I don't think that's an unreasonable claim. Uh, the fact that other people did it the same way without knowing the way we'd done it uh, doesn't detract uh, from the value of what was done. But a lot of people came to see what was done, and it's impossible to say now how much inspiration it gave. But I think probably the biggest inspiration was that people saw that Lyons had managed to do it at all. And that they probably didn't pay too much attention to the way it was done, but the fact that Lyons were doing it was a great stimulus to other people to go away and do something similar. But I also echo Morris's point about not pushing the technology too far, because in Leo 2 we did do just that, and it caused us a lot of trouble. We thought we'd be clever and put the pulse rate up in the store four times. We did eventually make it work, which was extremely hard to do, and I think it was probably tactically a mistake. Because by the time, what usually happens is by the time you get this last ounce out of the technology, the technology itself has moved on, and you don't uh, get the benefit in good time much better to take the technology about halfway to the limit or something like that uh, and wait for it to improve. The same thing could be said of course stores in relation to KDF9 for example. And finally I think the last point that uh, wants to be make, made is in computer engineering Murphy's law applies because anything can go wrong someday it will you better be organized to cope with it. I think that's the conclusions that I wanted to draw from this very rapid chapter on the course.
used in the uh, in the Cambridge machine. No, we didn't. Actually. And uh, why did you choose different ones? I tell you, um, we were nervous about the EF50 base. We thought that the EF50 base was potentially uh, unreliable. <coughs> so instead of using EF50s where we could, we used um, an SP65, which had an optical base, which we thought would be a better contact. The electrical characteristics are very much the same. Um, but we had to use the F50s for the um, amplifiers in the storage units, but elsewhere we didn't. And I think we used double triodes, which I don't think Monish did, in order to save subjects, so we probably got away with rather fewer subjects in that way. But the, the circuitry was very much the same. As I say, we were very reluctant to change anything until we knew exactly why it was made the way it was in the first place. Was this simply a venture by Lions, or was there some government or civil service support for this? Absolutely no government in involvement whatsoever. <coughs> it was Lions' own idea, and they paid for it entirely. So they got no encouragement uh, from the government, and nor <coughs> were they looking for any encouragement from the government. Did not some of the other people, like English Electric and AI, get some support? Well, I can't answer for that. Well, English Electric didn't know. <laughs> I think at that time often, very few often. people got some support, but I do seem to remember there was a guaranteed order for a number of Ferranti Pegasuses, which was a bit later on. Or was it Ferranti Mark I? I can't that, that, that refers to Ferranti Pegasuses, but there was uh, NRDC support for um, the early Ferranti work, and the early Manchester University work, certainly. Anyway, Lyons got nothing uh, from the government at that time whatsoever. The, the only thing that helped me, well, I suppose you could say, was that uh, the Ordnance Board came along and asked us to do some calculations for them uh, before the uh, one who was fully operational and clerical work. It was doing a certain amount of um, uh, scientific work for other people uh, on the contract list for shell attraction systems. Jeff Helmore, you mentioned uh, that Leo was a foundation of DP. Um, what about the, lang the programming languages and techniques that you're using? Did you develop anything that one might see now that's led to anything else in DP languages? Um, well, not for Leo 1, because there was no language used for Leo 1. I mean, we were using the same, essentially the same programming technique that we inherited from Morris, um, which meant writing in machine code, albeit you used um, uh, Mnemonic versions of the instructions, uh, and you use the decimal forms of the addresses and rows of addresses and all that sort of thing. But uh, we didn't uh, we didn't have any idea of a programming language for the O1, and I don't we think we had any for the O2 either. Did we begin to never send it out? Well, the, 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 uh, the Cambridge system was a form of assembly code, I suppose. <laughs> A very sophisticated one, like you said, uh, uh, for, its, for its time, and it's much more sophisticated. Uh, it seemed to me, at least, and I'm not a programmer, it seemed to be several years ahead of other people's um, at that stage. It remains so for quite a few years. But can I ask a personal question? Where did you come from into computers? Well, I got, um, I got interested in radio when I was quite young, and uh, I can remember my father building a crystal set when I was three in about 1922, and listening to the children's are on that, and I got interested in radio, progressively built radio sets at, at school and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, having taken a physics degree, I went into radar during the war, and that gave me a fairly good acquaintance with pulse circuitry, and I went back to Cambridge and decided I would do research in ultrasonics, um, partly because I was inspired by a, an ultrasonic trainer who was built at uh, TRE by Dr. Utley, who did later go to the NPO. And this used an ultrasonic method for simulating the behavior of h 2 radars. I thought that was very interesting. And I had a slightly mad idea that it could be used for exploring the inside of living creatures, possibly even people. But um, Mr. Ratcliffe turned me off that, saying that that really wasn't a, a guarantee to get me a PhD. So I thought I'd better <laughs> preserve idea. In fact, it wouldn't have worked at this time. The technology wasn't up to it. But um, I put in a thesis on absorption of ultrasonic waves and liquids, which was not terribly well understood. And I don't think it's even now terribly well understood if it comes to that. Um, and that put me in a position to uh, 
become a computer engineer. Of course, I didn't have that idea, but uh, Lance were advertising for a job. Morris had told me that the way to do this had been to build a machine themselves, because they couldn't find anyone who could do it for them. And uh, it seemed a suitably crazy enterprise to get involved in. <laughs> I used to come and consult you about propagation. <coughs> I used to come and consult you about propagation of ultrasonic waves. I don't know if I knew any more about it than you did. <laughs> but uh, it was a big help in designing the delay tubes, and we did make quite a lot of alterations to design the short delay tubes. Uh, in the short delay tubes, you have a problem, which Morris didn't mention, that is, of course, of multiple reflections. So, because in the long tube, there's enough inherent attenuation in the mercury stuff that's been down the tube three times. It's sufficiently weak compared to the signals that have gone down only once to be ignored. But with the short tubes, that's not true. We had to introduce some attenuation artificially, and all manner of ingenious devices were stuck into the beam and fiddled round and round. I think eventually we came up with a kind of paddle, that um, a sort of corrugated paddle, which you turned round and eventually gave you enough uh, attenuation to make the round trip signals weak enough to ignore. But I know we did a lot of experimenting. Um, how did the budget and the time to actually build the layout compare with what it was planned to be? This is also a question I would like to ask my colleagues. I can't remember that we had a very uh, exact timetable for how long it was going to take. What it actually took was it was built and working as a computer in about two years, I think, but it didn't have its input and output arrangements going until. 1953, about the summer of 53, we got all that going. We didn't have enough confidence in it to turn it on to clerical work in anger until early 1954. But uh, we were very gratified that when we started doing payroll, we never failed to get the payroll out in any week. I knew the machine often broke down, but we were able to mend it quickly enough that we'd get the payroll out within a week. We also started doing the payroll for the Ford Motor Company that summer in 1954, and they did not miss their payroll either. So um, we offset the sum of liability by being able to find out what was wrong with the machine quickly and put it right. And, and then by make, make, minimizing the amount of time lost by the faults during operation in the manner that I've tried to describe. But it took about, um, construction started in the autumn of 1949, um, and it was the main machine was finished in about two years, but the thing wasn't in its final form for about another two, I would say four years is a reasonable period of time to say it took to get it all going, satisfaction. But I don't think that was, uh, there wasn't a precise timetable at that, at that stage, how long it would take. And that was really remarkably patient, uh, nevertheless. Yeah. I thought. John Cooper. I think Lyons undertakes a manufacturer of the equipment. Uh, well, 01 was thought of as one machine that, that was probably really the only one they'd ever do, you see, but by the time they'd got uh, well on with it, and it was clearly going to work, and the thing was working, they decided they would go into business and manufacture them for other people. They started this company called Leo Computers Limited, uh, which was registered, but didn't trade officially, and it was registered probably in about 54 or 55, didn't trade very much for about another two years. There is in existence a very interesting uh, sound film which was made for publicity purposes in '57. We would have the time to show it this afternoon, but uh, I'm sure that uh, the Science Museum ought to have a copy of that if got one. It's very interesting to see the attitudes which are expressed implicitly in this film about uh, how you should go about using a computer in your office. Lance actually made 11 Leo Mark IIs to, to sell, and I think they sold. And and Tommy Thomas, who worked on the magnetic drum, which I should have mentioned. There are some other people in the audience who make contributions to other machines of Manchester, but uh, Tony said I must not stray and I must stick to Mark I, so that's what I'm going to do. Now, Freddie Williams went to the States about the same time that Morris was referring to, uh, 45 and 46. To contribute to a radar, a set of radar books which were being written. And he saw at Bell Labs some experiments on 
and the cancellation of echoes, ground echoes in radar, which involve moving signals from a cathode ray tube, um, obtained by putting a, a metal plate on the face of the cathode ray tube, from one tube to another tube, and then back again, uh, as a method of storage. Then he came back to TRE, and about August, September time of 46, he um, started to set up this sort of system with a view to trying to store digital pattern. And by December, he uh, had stored one digit at TRP. <laughs> <laughs> able to draw this, this is it. Um, we were interested in electrons, unlike Morris. In fact, we were interested in secondary electrons. And these uh, give from a metal plate in front of the cathode ray tube this kind of signal if that pattern is drawn on the cathode ray tube. So that uh, Freddie Williams' idea was that this pulse, which he called an anticipation pulse, told a circuit or an individual or you that there was going to be this gap in the trace. And when the trace was switched on again, there was a positive pulse which um, was the same area as this anticipation pulse. So this was called the anticipation pulse system. And um, as I say, this was December 46. He invited me to, uh, by that time I'd been in his group for four years, and he invited me to uh, accompany him to Manchester. And I stayed as a member of TRE, but on outside duty in Manchester, in order that I could draw stores. Uh, from TRE, free of charge, <laughs> and supply the project. Uh, for, for three months or so, uh, largely at the beginning of 1947, I did experiments varying the speed of this trace and the focus of the trace and so on and so forth, and came to the conclusion that uh, this pulse, which uh, didn't play any part in the original anticipation pulse system, was much more useful than the anticipation pulse itself. And so, uh, sometime in March of 47, I remember a session with Freddie Williams, and I convinced him that we should drop that pulse and use that pulse. And after some discussion, we agreed. Now, uh, the, use of the, the reason the positive pulse is better is that uh, it's more uniform over the whole face of the cathode ray tube. And, uh, also, that as you'll see from some pictures I've got in the slide, the, uh, the, the, the distinction here between a 1 and a 0 is between a negative pulse and zero, whereas the distinction on the positive pulse is between a positive pulse and a negative pulse, and any engineer knows that the, that gives you a better definition. So we switched to that scheme, and this resulted in a lot of schemes, dot-dash system of storage, and uh, the defocus focus system storage, which is the one that actually went into the parameter machines. So this original pulse that we started off with, in fact, was abandoned and we switched to that system. If I could now show the first slide, how do I do, do something with this?
and other next. This is the uh, nice part of this part here, and this is the anticipation part. And here we see a 1, a 0, and a 0. And these are the just digit marks. So you can see that uh, the distinction is between that rather fine positive part and that rather nice negative part. Now, if you keep this in mind, you'll see that this is symmetrical with that, so the baseline here remains steady, whatever pattern I write in, whether it's uh, whatever notch you want to one puts in the baseline remains steady. <coughs> this is the, it spells, spells out, if you're in the right position, calibrated store. Uh, and it's 32 by 32, and you can see that this is the dot dash system. Dots for naught, dashes for ones. And um, that sort of performance can be obtained, could be obtained at that time, with an ordinary cathode ray tube. But of course, if you improve the cathode ray tube, you can get improved performance. And in particular, uh, I remember a few things. If you use <coughs> filter glass for the cathode ray tube, then nasty charges built up on the surface of the glass, which ruined the system. So lead glass was an uh, advantage. The focus was also um, necessary. It was even necessary to improve it in order to get any more digits on the tube. And so. We asked GEC to develop a tube. It was also necessary that the screen on which these charges on the inside of the glass were deposited was, uh, was pure. And um, IBM, who uh, licensed this kind of store uh, to start off their 700 series, um, told me that although they'd moved their Chateau factory up the Hudson to Poughkeepsie to get rid of the dirt, they were actually troubled by pollen. <laughs> so it's really quite a, an interesting thing. And of course, as, as you increased, as you made the focus much, much better, um, the necessity for a pure and pure screen uh, became more important. So DC did quite a lot of work on uh, uh, this cathode uh, ray tube business. And this shows the most digits we ever stored on a cathode ray tube. Uh, it's the defocus focus system. Large dots are a defocus spot, representing a one, a positive pulse, <coughs> a, a negative pulse. And if and, and the small spots are a focus spot, representing a naught. On that screen, there are 2,560 digits. And that is the uh, state of affairs that is described in the little note I wrote, which some of you have got, uh, which I submitted to Morris for inclusion in his uh, conference. When we went to, to the Ferranti machine, in order to get the increased reliability that other speakers were talking about, we halved the number of digits again and went back to 32 by 40 uh, in order to make sure that the thing worked really well. Uh, if I'd been able to sit with it night and day, then I could have kept this working. But of course, you can't sit with it. So we, we made that concession of, of half the storage uh, to reliability. Now, that is uh, a picture of Freddie Williams. I've included that to include Freddie Williams. Uh, for those of you who never met him. And uh, you will see that this machine is constructed of 19-inch racks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, we've worked with them for four years at TRE on uh, radar experiments. And this is a primitive form of VDU, which is a method of input to our computer uh, with uh, uh, a cathode ray tube there and a keyboard. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Tootil said that this was actually Freddie Williams marrying me to the machine. <laughs> 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 uh, 
and double length instructions. And we came to an agreement that a double length instruction, that is one with two addresses, double instruction, uh, was worth 1.3 times a single address instruction. And this confirmed me in the view that uh, we should indeed stick to a single address instruction. Going to a, a double length instruction was not worth it on any grounds and would have ruled out having two instructions per word in any case. So that was a most interesting conversation that uh, I had with um, Wilkinson. <coughs> now, um, we then went on from about uh, October when the contact with Ferrantes was uh, signed, November, I think, it was signed. Um, we went on to design substantially larger machines um, in which there were um, two main features which stand out above all the others. One was uh, the invention of the B line, which is quite an interesting story. Uh, most of the people working there uh, were thinking of different structures. Uh, the people I'm considering are Williams, myself, Newman, and uh, Tootill. We were considering possible different structures, things like two accumulators, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'll give you my example. I was interested in splitting the instructions from the numbers, because this would have allowed me to double the speed of the machine, because whilst uh, extracting a number from one half of the store, I could have been getting the, other the next instruction from the other half of the store. But I was advised by all the programmers I spoke to that I couldn't do this. So next thing I proposed was that we should have a separate accumulator for instructions. Would that be all right? Uh, and the answer was still no. Um, but you see the kind of thing that was going on. We were trying to think of different uh, structures. Now in one conversation, the four people I've mentioned, uh, there was a discussion, and out of this came the index register as being the best new suggestion for the machine, and so we put in the B tube. It's called the B tube because we had an accumulator and a control, A and C, uh, and so we called it B. Uh, the, other, the other very interesting feature is that um, we decided to link the cathode ray tube store to a backing store using a magnetic drum. And, uh, the magnetic drum uh, in the paper that some of you have, which is the one at the time of uh, Morris's conference, um, was 1,024 words. And um, it was a 10-digit uh, system. In fact, uh, all our work was done at uh, 10 digits. 10, 10 microseconds, sorry, 10 microseconds, uh, and that made it very much easier than the microsecond that, uh, that Morris is trying to deal with. Um, the cathode ray tube store um, ran at eight and a half microseconds in its early days, but when it went into the front machine, again, for practical reasons, we expanded it to 10 microseconds. So we of course, the, the immediate access feature of the cathedral tube store uh, more than compensated for this slower digit. That is to say, we could switch to any line uh, within 40 microseconds. And uh, this couldn't be done, of course, with any, any delay line system. So, so we came out with much the same speeds of things as the ones we talking about. Uh, speed of instructions. <coughs> There's an interesting thing about the magnetic drum and the, the order code. In the order code, I introduced a relative control transfer with the idea that if, uh, uh, say, a subroutine were put in a different place 
from the store from which it had been programmed, the relative control transfer would not need to be changed because it simply moved it back and forward relative to the instruction at which you were at. The other thing was, I put a tagline, which we called the 65th line, on each of the pages or blocks of words on the magnetic drum. So that there were 64 useful lines and a tagline, the 65th line. This was with some vague notion that programmers would be able to move tracks around on the drum, not necessarily in, a, in the fixed order in which they had originally appeared on the drum and still keep track of them. Now the programmers who used the machine uh, never took advantage of this, but these two sorts of ideas were the seed of uh, the virtual memory and the one level store which came along in later and cheap. So those are of special interest uh, to me. The, there was a lot of discussion about, I think everybody had a lot of discussion, about the incidence of the various orders, that is in particular how many multiplications would there be relative to all the other instructions. And um, the, in the early days of the Ferranti Mark I, this is giving the answer, whereas the decisions were taken before we knew the answer. But, but it's better to give you the answer than to speculate endlessly. 16% um, of all time was spent on magnetic drum transfers. Magnetic drum transfers. 28% uh, <coughs> was spent on multiplication. And 56% of time was spent on the other orders, uh, like addition, the orders, and so on. Now, what that means is that if we had gone into the Ferranti machine design with a slow multiplier, the machine would have, in fact, have been five times slower than was the actual case, because what we did was choose that degree of parallel multiplier which made sense. The, or these orders took 1.2 milliseconds and nine milliseconds if there would be orders, and the multiplier took 2.16 milliseconds. Now that parallel multiplier was a half parallel multiplier. It multiplied 40 digits by 20, and then 40 digits by the remaining 20. So the two stabs were taken to get a 40 times 40 multiplication, and that took a total time of 2.16 milliseconds. So that, that the quite surprising thing also of these figures mean that if you, if you just fiddle around with those numbers, you'll see that one in five of all orders obeyed, not written, you're talking about orders obeyed, one in five of all orders obeyed uh, were multiplications, which is really quite I start I also how long have I have five minutes. There was a, a great interest with Newman being in Manchester in number theory at that time. And so I put in some special orders along these lines, which might interest especially those who have got the paper. If you imagine that these lines represent forty digit numbers. We're interested in multi multi length numbers or number theory. That is to say, in that particular example, all of this is one hundred and twenty digit number. Then if we take a simple example and we want to add two of these, we we will get a carry in this position from or we may get a carry in this position from the sum of these two. Now, uh, this area is the most sig is, is the accumulator, and the area here in which 
uh, this carrier's appear is the most significant part of the accumulator. So that we've added two numbers to 40 digits, because that's all we can add in the accumulator, and produce the carry in the most significant digit. Now, I produced an order which then switched the significance of the accumulator so that this position became the least uh, part of the accumulator and that position became the most. So, so that became a digit in the least position for this next addition and so on. And this order I called reverse A because it simply it costs one flip flop. Cheap. Now, uh, if you, if any of you are sufficiently interested, you can try multiplying together three-digit numbers, and you will find why I three hundred and twenty-digit numbers. Suppose you multiply those two numbers together instead of adding them, it becomes quite complex. And uh, if you use the orders I provided in that list that some of you have got, uh, you'll see why I provide them. Now, of course, in the whole context of computing, that um, was a complete dead end, if you like, because uh, if anyone was interested in that in a modern computer, they could take enormous trouble to do it, because they would be about the only person interested in that sort of work. So it wasn't a, a <coughs> development which lasted, and in fact, within a couple of years of completing the design of the frantic machine, which was done by October 1949. Um, so that by 51, when uh, we, the frantic machine was delivered, I and Diodlers and Tom Thomas were already thinking of building a second machine, which went to the other extreme and, uh, and used um, hardware working point arithmetic. So, um, there you are, Tony. You said I mustn't speak about anything but my one. That's how I'll get. Thank you.
there, there were two things in the Mark One which students suggested. Uh, one, was, one was that, uh, and the other was much more useful because it became the basis of earning. It was a random number generator. And there were, so there were two orders which, uh, which students were responsible for, and those were the ones. Uh, Michael Wright. Uh, you, uh, you said you went to the States, and this was one of the triggering points, and also Morris said he went to the States, and that was one of the triggering points for him. Um, were the triggering points essentially meeting, you didn't actually say who you went to, at least uh, Morris didn't. Uh, uh, did, did you go to see the ENIAC people? Were they a trigger point, or who was it actually that uh, well, fired things off? I did, I did mention that um, uh, the Cathedral Radio store came out of analog experiments. Mm. on radar. Mm. Um, so, so far as I, I was concerned, you, you, you see, this cathode ray tube store was the first um, immediate access store to work. So a lot of the design which uh, centred round uh, the Mercury delay line, and we shall hear more of that from Don Davis, uh, was because the store wasn't an immediate access store. So the things you, I needed to know in order to build those machines were, were very small, uh, that, 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 and they were known to Babbage, I believe. Uh, that the, the, the machine had three parts, a store, control, and accumulator. There were things called instructions, which uh, had an address and a function. Um, there was a, co a control transfer, and there was a test instruction. Now, on, on that, so I may have missed one point, but I can't honestly tell you where uh, those, that small number of facts actually came from. What I know was that there was certainly current, both in this country and in the States, um, by December 1946, when we moved up to Manchester. No, I, I thought they'd been you know, fairly well known. Uh, Since significantly before that, yes, uh, but uh, uh, it right. was actually just uh, who? Perhaps could could I ask the uh, Morris? Could I just um, could we just say that there is going to be a, a general discussion at, at, after the next um, okay. presentation, and I think this is a sort of question which might go better there if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Any other points specifically on the Manchester? I've got the logic diagram of the, I, uh, got the logic diagram of the mark on the, uh, <laughs> <laughs>
machines with an ACE. ACE, by the way, automatic computing engine, uh, engine by deference to the uh, uh, to Babbage, of course. And uh, the origins were uh, a report by uh, Turing in 1945 uh, to the executive committee of the Labour Agreement, which actually had to approve the project, which they did. Um, and this report actually is a remarkable document. It has been reprinted recently, which is available. Um, and uh, sets out the reasons for doing the project and what Turing believes the machine should be. Um, the kind of calculations that he describes are partly numerical calculations of interest to scientists and engineers. He also describes the use of it for um, clerical work and says that he won't attempt to do this because of the large amount of input and output and he wants to avoid this problem. He talks also about uh, uh, logical problems, uh, combinatorial problems, uh, number theory, um, and what else? Um, oh, and uh, I think I don't think it's in that report, but I, I remember discussing with him the use of the machine for weather forecasting. So uh, it had a very wide uh, range of intended uses, but mostly in the range of in the nature of large-scale mathematical calculations. In fact, the people who came into the project all had a background in large-scale numerical work. Uh, Turing himself, of course, in crypt analysis, well, he must in, indeed have felt the need for a large amount of computing which they didn't have, except the Colossus, which was a very special purpose machine that uh, he helped with. Um, then um, uh, uh, there was um, Jim Wilkinson, who came from uh, uh, working in uh, ballistics um, calculations. So I think uh, Tom Vickers was with him at Fort Austin. Tom Vickers is here today. Um, uh, and uh, I, I came in much later, but uh, my background was in the uh, tube alloys project for building uh, atomic bomb, uh, where we had to do enormous amounts of calculation just with large numbers of people turning on speakers. So we were all of us well aware of this kind of requirement. That's what drove the project. Um, now, Turing's report doesn't justify very much the individual details of the design, so one has to guess a little bit there. But the main interesting feature of the ACE uh, uh, that he was describing there was optimum programming. That's been hinted at already. Uh, he was already convinced that it had to be a delay line store. He hadn't heard of any other possibilities, uh, and so that's what he chose. Um, and the delay line store, you have to wait for numbers to come round. And he wanted some way of avoiding some of the uh, cost and time that this caused. Uh, and the technique was uh, to place the instructions around in the delay lines so they came up at the right times when you needed them, uh, to use a judicious mixture of short delay lines, single, double, quadruple, uh, word, four word, and long ones of 32 words, um, and be very clever in the way you laid out your uh, information and your data so that you could, uh, generally speaking, avoid the latency problem. Also, when you wanted to take numbers sequentially out of a delay line, arrange for the thing to precess, uh, so that every time you took a number out, uh, you shortened it for a short while, and then you go around and come back uh, with all the numbers shifted around one place. All these were clever tricks. Um, and they did, in fact, in the end, have a very considerable effect on the speed of operation. But, of course, they made uh, programming into uh, a, an entirely different kind of problem. You first had to solve the programming problem, then you had to solve a nice little puzzle, which is where to put all the things into the delay lines, and so the programming had a second step. Uh, clearly, this wasn't a machine designed for everyday people coming in and using it for the way that we use special use and so on, for high-level languages and so on. It was uh, a machine designed for uh, people who were devoted to programming uh, and getting the maximum speed out of the machine. Now, that was the way Turing conceived it, and it was never questioned after that. So it wasn't a question of carefully thinking up the uh, strategy, the question that he made that choice. And it was natural, I think, for Turing, who was a man who liked to solve complex problems. He tended to do things in a complex way, uh, if that was possible. And I think it was part of the whole, All the stories that you read in his biographies tell you you remember how he uh, worked out that uh, uh, there was a link missing in the uh, chain of his bicycle. He worked out that he could turn his uh, the crank around by so many revolutions, then he could get off and replace the, uh, the chain on on the right. It was much better than actually making the link. Um, well, that, that, that <laughs> business of solving problems, I think, may have driven this decision. It turned out to be an interesting and useful decision if you had to work with this kind of store. Of course, as soon as we had uh, easily available 
um, random access to laws, it was no longer of any interest. So it was a temporary phase in the history of computing, an interesting one, and one that did extract useful, uh, useful speed. Um, now, it was particularly valuable when you had uh, the opportunity to spend a lot of time optimizing a very small part of the program. And that often happens. The inner loop uh, is worth spending some trouble on. And so the machine, when it was finally working, tended to specialize uh, in, in its applications. Um, and uh, numerical analysis, uh, of course, in general, but in particular, uh, the manipulation of linear equations, of matrices, and it ended up with a, a vast library of extremely powerful, uh, um, uh, extremely powerful functions to uh, perform on matrices, which turned in the end into an interpretive system, uh, which you could quickly assemble these various bricks, as they were called, uh, to do matrix operations with enormous efficiency. So that, in fact, uh, when it was all working, its uh, first, well, its major applications for a long time were in the aircraft industry, working out flutter problems which had become very necessary, uh, that was just the time when flutter became a problem and when it was necessary for the certification of an aircraft that it had flutter calculations for the cover. And so the Canberra bomber and a large number of other planes were, had their flutter calculations done in this machine. So that's the sort of background to the peculiar way in which the machine was designed. I want to give you an idea of the, uh, of the historical sequence because it does affect the decisions. Turing's proposal... I'm sorry. <laughs> Turing's proposal uh, was in 45. Um, we carried out uh, um, the, a lot of design studies were carried out. A, a group at the in the mathematics division kept writing programs to see if they could get the design better and better. And meanwhile, hardware was being developed uh, by a post office research station at Donis Hill. This has an interesting background too. During the discussion at the um, executive committee, it seems that one of the people there was actually wanting the computer to be designed and developed because of the requirements of cryptanalysis. Um, and uh, the, uh, therefore, Turing's background um, at Bletchley Park had something to do with it. And in fact, the very people who worked on Colossus uh, at Dollis Hill were brought into this team and ran the team at Dollis Hill to do this. But this arrangement didn't work well. And in fact, there were at least two very bad hiccups in the organization. This was one of them. It didn't work well, and in the end, we separated. And interesting enough, Dollis Hill went ahead to build the ACE computer. Uh, we actually provided the design for much of it, and it became the Mosaic, which was an administrative defense machine, uh, which you may have heard of. That was uh, the ACE you know, under another name. Um, the, the same development continuing, uh, its momentum uh, at uh, Dollis Hill. Um, then Harry Husky pro came from America. He'd worked on ENIAC um, and uh, uh, put a lot of energy into the uh, team, which was flagging a little bit from the uh, sort of rather poor beginning that started. And he uh, hashed up the idea of building a test assembly uh, in order to be able to uh, try out the uh, principles of the machine quickly. And in fact, that was a very simple design, and here is its complete logic diagram in which every, I can guarantee every trigger and every gate is written out separately in this diagram. So uh, it's all there. Um, and in fact, this was the genesis of the pilot model. It, the test assembly was never completed. We began building it. Um, its electronic design was a bit hairy. Um, I personally wonder whether it would ever have worked. Um, some of its mechanical design was a bit hairy. Um, and a, a few months after Husky left, it was decided to close down the, uh, the test assembly, uh, I had a part in that decision. I think it was probably the right decision, uh, but still things didn't go very well. Uh, in 48, two separate teams had, uh, been, were working at MPL, one in the what was called the electronic section, the other one with maths people, maths people continuing with their programming, which was getting very boring <coughs> to program machines that we used to uh, write, write programs you could never test. For one thing, we knew it was full of bugs, and we couldn't find them. Uh, so uh, it was getting a bit tedious, um, and uh, I'm not quite sure of the exact dates, but roughly speaking, uh, fairly early in '49, this all came finally uh, to, together. And as you can see, a tremendous amount, three years, have been wasted really in this uh, procedure. Uh, but at that stage, all the people in the maths division interested got up and marched across to the electronic section and sat down there, and everybody started building. And we forgot about programming and actually started the solving lines. And from then on, it all worked extremely well. I must also say that a number of new personalities have come in in this time, in particular, Ted Newman and David Clayton, uh, both in here, uh, from EMI, had brought in a tremendous amount of experience in electronics design 
coming from uh, radar work and pre-war television work, and David will tell us something about that. Um, so we had a lot of input there, and uh, Fred Osborne uh, came in to help us with mechanical design. He is here. Um, and um, also Mr. Colebrook uh, took over as the leadership of the team, and for the first time brought in a strong <coughs> Uh, leadership of a combined team. And from that time on, things worked very fast. So the first programs were running rather haltingly in 1950, and uh, uh, by about the end of 1950, we were running useful programs. I remember I was running ray tracing programs. Um, in 51, we had um, a multiplier fitted and a new control system, which saved uh, on some of the logic which Ted Newman designed, uh, was put in. Uh, and that virtually was then the completion of its development, apart from the magnetic drum, magnetic drum which came apart in 54, and which was very important for its application. Um, it was operating as a service from 1952 onwards, it was moved to a new location, and it really was, I it may have been one of the first uh, really for, uh, working commercial services. We were selling our services to industry, partly the aircraft industry. I worked for the uh, Secretary of Mines Research Board, I remember. I did some work for. Um, the, um, um, oh, uh, what his name now? The people who deal with mo deal with motor traffic. Uh, I did some work on traffic lights. Uh, uh, everybody was very busy very then using it as a, a real service. Uh, so that's a little bit of the history. As you can see, it came from Husky's original idea, which in fact Turing supported. Turing uh, had left us in the meantime uh, to go first to Cambridge uh, and then on to uh, Manchester University. Now the peculiarity of optimum programming. Uh, is that you have to have a fairly complica complicated instruction uh, to deal with it. Um, this shows the form of the instruction where the first uh, field here is a three-digit field giving you the, um, uh, giving you the uh, next in instruction source. That's the tank from which you'll take the next instruction. Then the source and destination. Uh, now, the sources and destinations are not just stores. The uh, sources and destinations actually carry with them uh, the operation uh, code. So everything uh, about the operation is defined by means of the source and the destination, which is another peculiar property uh, introduced, I think, principally for the pilot model. Uh, then there are two timing numbers, a weight and a timing number, um, and a go digit, which helps to allow you to stop when you want to and uh, be able to step on. It was quite important for uh, synchronizing input and output. The transfers uh, that you could carry out were either single transfers or multiple ones. Multiple ones could be very valuable. They could, for example, transfer the whole of a tank uh, into another tank in one instruction, or they could add a whole series of numbers into one short tank, or into one double eight tank, or quadruple, quadruple eight tank in one instruction. So there was a little bit of vector operation here. Rather primitive, but it was the sort of thing that uh, now appears in uh, large number of countries uh, was here in a primitive form. Uh, uh, now, the, the wait, in fact, was the uh, time before the transfer started. Uh, the timing number de de determined the end of the transfer. And then immediately afterwards, you got the next instruction. Um, or you could have this single serial bit here set, in which case you've got a single operation, which you could shift anywhere in the field, um, and uh, leaving the next instruction fixed. So it was quite complicated, but uh, of course quite powerful, if you knew how to use it very tricky uh, to do well. And just to show you the kind of functional sources and destinations that we have here, um, you can see that it's a fairly complicated uh, table of uh, sources and destinations. Just to give you an example, um, if I send things to uh, TS, uh, that's the tempor uh, temporary store, a short store, uh, 26 and 27, I can get out logical operations and an XOR. Uh, out of them. Um, by sending them here, I multiply them, or I can add and subtract into an accumulator and so on, um, or send them to the punch. Now, a very clever thing here, uh, I think um, rather like the clever scheme used in, in Cambridge, is the way you deal with initial orders. We've got somehow to get the thing started. And what was done here uh, was to arrange that the first instruction was always zeros. It starts off with the instruction register cleared as soon as you push the initial input key. And that means you take the input off the Horowitz machine and send it to the straight into the instruction register, which means that you obey the first line of the, of the, uh, that's on the card. The card, by the way, 
is punched horizontally, uh, not the way a card is meant to be punched, but it can, can be punched in binary, uh, 32 bits across the card. It makes the card into rather like lace when it's being well punched with it. It turns out that the cards can actually still fit through like that. Uh, we did other clever things like pushing the chads back in when we wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> Even that one, it's a perfectly uh, standard technique. After a while, it was a good idea to reproduce the card to pull the chads back up. But you could do it. So I won't go into detail, it will take too long, but you can see that by choosing your source and destination, you actually decided what the logical, what the operation was. You <coughs> had a separate op code. Uh, uh, just a word about uh, input and output. Uh, again, almost without thinking deeply about it, we chose Horus machines. There were Horus machines all over the place, in the mathematics division anyway, um, and we knew them well. Uh, it fell to me after Stanley Gill left, uh, to actually do the machine engineering of the Horus machine it was not, and I had all the problems of noise and so on. Uh, we, could, so we solved them very well, and we introduced later faster machines. Uh, this gave us a very high speed of input. Uh, we were taking in uh, 12 32-bit numbers uh, per card at uh, 100 cards, or sorry, coming in at 200 cards per minute eventually, going out at 100 cards per minute, which was a very great deal faster than we could have done with paper tape. And it was eventually, in fact fairly soon, highly reliable. It um, meant a lot of uh, careful adjustments and one had to know how to adjust horror machines, uh, but we learned how to do that. Um, now this actually turned out to be our first level of store, but long before we had the magnetic drum, it was quite common in large matrix operations uh, to be continually punching out onto cards and then even sometimes uh, rearranging the cards as part of the, uh, as part of the algorithm. Uh, and putting them back into the input reader again. And this was therefore a, a very tedious process, but of uh, treating the machine really rather like a, a complex horror machine. But it was very powerful, and it was all we had. We that way we could invert very large matrices that couldn't have been done any other way. And the operators became extremely skilled in the handling of card. So that was the <coughs> background to the, uh, the sort of uh, system design of this uh, of this machine. But just to sort of summarize, uh, the thing came uh, as a requirement of the mathematical division with numerical analysis as the uh, uh, driving force. Um, it was aimed at the fastest operation that we could get, given that the delay line was going to be the memory. It went through a number of stages. Eventually, ACE was built, but by that time was a dinosaur. It was out of its time. Already, uh, of course, stores had been invented, and I tried to deflect the uh, ace in that direction at one time and uh, didn't succeed. It had too much momentum. Um, so there was a three-year delay as a result of, I suppose, organizational problems. The pilot, pilot model achieved all its objectives. Um, it was fast. It was very simple. At 800 volts, which I was pretty much a record. Um, it led to three machines. Of course, I mentioned the, uh, Mosaic to Deuce, of which I think 32 were made uh, and uh, uh, very uh, widely used to the Bendix G15, which was made in USA after Husky went back. He designed this around the magnetic drum, replacing the, uh, re replacing the um, tanks by a magnetic drum. In fact, the drum had two heads. You actually read and wrote uh, and rewrote onto the drum. It was a, not a normal kind of drum. Uh, it was rewritten every time it went round. Uh, so it was a very strange drum. And the Bendix was a successful machine. 400 were made. The 400 was the last one. It was gold-plated. Uh, and the Husky had one in his garage, uh, so he must have been the first person to have a personal computer. <laughs> and, uh, it, it gave out enormous quantities of heat in the Berkeley sun, it was rather unpleasant, uh, but uh, it, it worked. So it had a lot of progeny, um, and the ACE was eventually, eventually built. At that point I'd like to hand over to David Clayton to talk about some of the engineering aspects of the ACE.
there were we finding ourselves in radio positions of NPL, whereas Donald and uh, most of the other people he has mentioned were the far end of the laboratory in that division. Um, now, the, my first job was, in fact, to make one of those um, items of equipment you mentioned there work. That was a mercury delay line, um, work with some electronics which had been made by a contractor. Now, it occurs to me that we've had much talk of um, mercury delay lines, but nobody has actually mentioned in detail how they are made. And I have here a diagram which I have rapidly made, which shows some detail. Um, essentially, you have a column of mercury which goes on and on that way. Here, is the crystal, a piezoelectric crystal, which is driven by this electrode. Um, you notice a gap between the electrode and the crystal. This is very important because if the electrode touches the crystal, um, it, it damps it enormously. So it's capacitively coupled to the crystal. The mercury makes contact with this side of the crystal. The whole thing is sealed, you hope, sealed so that the mercury doesn't run around behind the crystal and get in contact with the electrode and so on. This is a lump of insulator and the whole thing is held together with bolts. Okay. So um, you apply quite a large voltage, uh, oscillating voltage, we in fact use 15 megahertz on ours, drive the electrode which drives a sonic pulse through the mercury via the piezoelectric crystal. We have the same thing at the other end, and the crystal at the other end gives you a voltage for the input sonic, sonic wave. Um, the total attenuation in the long mercury delay line, by the way, was about 60 dB. That is 1,000 to 1. So you need a receiver at the far end, um, and you indeed you need a receiver with a good deal of constancy in its, um, in its game. Anyway, that's uh, a little aside, perhaps, on the subject of mercury delay lines. Now, Ted Newman and I arrived having worked during the war and subsequently at EMI at Hayes, where we had learned much of our technology from A.D. Bloomline, who had invented the cathode follow-up, the long-tailed pair, I think before the war, I'm not quite sure they invented that. But anyway, the thing, that, the contrast that struck me when I got to NPL was that at EMI, nearly all cathodes were not connected to Earth, whereas in the rest of the world, nearly all cathodes were connected to Earth. And the, the contrast was quite enormous. I have here a circuit diagram of a typical circuit. Sorry, I did these up before. A typical circuit that we developed um, for the ACE pilot model. Um, here we have a long tail pair, a double triode. The current is defined because this end of this resistor goes to minus 300 volts. Those two grids sit at about 200 volts, so we have like 100 volts across 33K, which gives us a defined 3 milliamps. And it doesn't matter what the grid bias is on, on these valves, so that as the valves deteriorate, um, we don't run into bother until the grids actually run into the current. So it's a fairly reliable technology from that point. Now, in this particular case here, we have a double triode. If this grid is higher than this grid, then all the current goes up that way. And if that grid is lower than that grid, then all the current goes up that way. Here we have two more splits. When the current gets there, it either goes that way or that way, depending on where that grid is. And that grid also connects there. <coughs> the current going up this way either goes that way or that way again, depending on where the grid 
so on. So we have two inputs, there's one input there, the other input here, which is coupled down from that valve there. So if both of these grids are up, all the current goes that way, and we've got and output. If one grid is down, the other grid is up, then the current either goes that way to there, or goes up that way to there. Those two are connected together, so that is XOR output, that is the two things are different. Else all the current goes up this way, we don't want to know about it. This is another piece of standard technology known as a DC coupling, where we have a signal up in the region of plus 200 volts, and we want to get it down to a level of minus 200 volts, we have a network consisting of four resistors and two capacitors, and the, the time constant chosen to match exactly, and everything in the garden works beautifully. Um, those are just two examples of technology. Another piece of technology is here. If we feed clock pulses in here, our clock pulses are typically one third of a microsecond in every one microsecond. So the current going went up here for one third of the time. It was capacitively coupled into these cathodes so that with an average current up here of 3 milliamps, the current up here was either 10 milliamps for a third of the time or zero the rest of the time. So we defined 10 milliamps dot current up there. Um, <coughs> Anyway, that, that is a typical example of the sort of um, the sort of <coughs> technology that went into our circuits. Um, now, coming back to mercury delay lines, um, I showed you one end of the sort of cross section of one end of the mercury delay line. The we started off with long and short horizontal delay lines. Subsequently, we developed the vertical delay lines, and this is a delay line for one word, and that is 32 microseconds. That's a late development of the scene. Subsequently, we built other sizes. This one is four words, that is 128 microseconds. And the initial long delay lines were all long horizontal ones, rather like John Pinkerton showed us in his picture. Um, subsequently, Donald Davis invented the folded long delay line. This one which stood this way up. The two reflectors at the bottom and two crystals at the top here. So the signal went down one tube and across up the other tube. And um, that was a latish development, but the delay lines in the deuce were all of this design thing. Um, instead, anybody wishing to know more about mercury delay lines and the storage technology. Perhaps I can refer them to that paper which was published in the IEE <coughs> 53. Now, um, I next want to talk about the um, magnetic drum. Um, we needed a backing store for the ACE pilot model to provide us with more storage capacity and we wondered for a long time how we would best do it. We said to ourselves, wouldn't it be nice if every track on a drum stored exactly the number of bits in one long road with later so that we could do a total transfer one to the other in one revolution of the drum 
transfer all the bits from one to the other. Um, we wish to avoid having a lot of buffer storage in the way. We concluded the only way to do this was to synchronize the drum to the machine. Um, we did some arithmetic about this and concluded that if we ran the drum at one ninth of the speed of the virtual delay line, we would indeed be able to transfer the whole of the contents from one level or the other in exactly one revolution of the drum being nine revolutions of the mercury delay line. And we worked out a system where we could do this on condition that we exactly synchronized drum to the mercury delay line <coughs> within an accuracy of plus or minus four microseconds. We consulted the experts about this, and they said, oh no, that's quite impossible. So we went away and did it. <laughs> and this is the some details of the drum we finished up with. Um, as it says here, drum revolution, nine milliseconds. The bit time was nine microseconds, that's 111,000 bits per second, and 1024 bits transferred in nine milliseconds. The <coughs> it had 16 reading and 16 recording heads to access the tracks, and they were shiftable to eight positions, so the, 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 we had them. Um, Altogether, 128 tracks, 1024 bits, which gave us that as the total capacity. Um, the way we managed to get this synchronization to work was to use a hysteresis motor, which runs, when it's running, behaves like a synchronous motor, and we were then able to control its, the phase of its drive to get it to synchronize accurately main clock pulse register. Now we subsequently went on, uh, th that is the, the pilot model drum, we subsequently went on to develop the ACE drum and rather than show you a slide of it, I have here the actual thing. The um, drum is inside there, this is the drive motor on top. And behind here is the actuator for the heads, which is um, a moving coil in a magnet, and that drives the heads which are down there, <coughs> up and down to 16 positions. And the performance of that was really rather remarkable, I think, even by today's standards. Um, the drum revolution time was 5 milliseconds, which is 200 revs a second. The peripheral velocity is in fact knocking on 200 miles an hour. Uh, the bit rate is a third of a megacycle. So it's, um, it's, th that was approaching the mercury delay line rate of its enough said that. Now we subsequently, as Donald remarked, went on to design the, the big ace computer. And I'd like to make a few remarks about that. It was in fact a three address machine. The pilot model and the juice were two address machines. The um, big ace was a three address machine. It had two source highways, one destination highway. Um, they all went via a function unit so that you could take two words out of mercury delay lines and, for instance, add them together and put the result back in mercury all in one word time. Moreover, we eliminated the time wasted by between instructions, 
one was mentioned. So we could, in fact, in the best uh, instances, do um, successive operations at, at uh, taking 32 microseconds each. Now, we increased the word time of, the, the word length of this machine to 48 bits. We've had some discussion of the number of bits in the word. Here we had 48, and that gave us enough bits in the word to control both sources and the destination and the timing of the instruction. Um, here we see mentioned the magnetic drum store. We in fact had four of these drums on the ACE, and that <coughs> gave us 32,000 words of information. Um, it also had an autonomous multiplier and an autonomous divider. So although multiplication, for instance, took about half a millisecond, we could set it going and come back and collect the product later on while we were doing something else in the function. Um, right, I think that's all I have to say. I think please go on for any questions. the crystal. You had to polish the, the crystal as well, because they had high degree. Yes, of do you remember why we had a gap between the electrodes and the crystal? I can't remember that. No, I can't. I've forgotten that. But certainly the essential thing was, uh, was that uh, why it worked with very low pressures in that, because it went through the crystal. Oh, right. yes. no, we work on exactly opposite principles. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
imagine. <laughs> We did at one time stuff some, I think it was lead or something, which, which was a good absorbent and acoustic match to the uh, crystal at the back uh, instead of that. I'm not sure whether we did it for all of them. But this is another one of the uh, black magic bits, I think. <laughs> there is a, a small point that people might be interested in about these, uh, these delay lines that went first one way and the other way because it's a bit difficult to get them right. And of course our director at that time was a Darwin and therefore belonged to the Wedgwood people. And because of this, what, what we did was to put, put a wedge of wood into the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that made it all right. <laughs> it first to me that there was three slides that Um, photograph of the ACE pilot model, which incidentally is to be seen for real in the Science Museum. And um, here are the short Mercury delay lines. Um, these here are two early reflecting ones, like the one I just showed you. And in the box at the back are some other Mercury sorry, box down there, um, are the old horizontal ones. That, strangely enough, is George Davis, who's in the... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that is an early control desk. And here we have the card punch and the card reader. This is a photograph of the a magnetic drum for the pilot model. Here is the drum surface. If you look carefully, you can see some scratches on it where the things <laughs> have actually touched down. But since the surface velocity on the pilot model was um, about 90 miles an hour, we had to be rather careful that the heads didn't run. Here's a stack of heads. And this is an actuator. Now, this photograph is actually of a two-position actuator, which pushes the heads up and down one of two <coughs> actions. Those actuators were subsequently replaced by eight-position ones. We, in fact, have designed and made a 16-position actuator, which did not prove to be reliable, so the machine finished up with an eight-position actuator. Now, just here, where did is actually a tooth ring um, on top of the drum which had 1,024 teeth on it and that was used to generate the top forces uh, for the whole thing. This is a photograph of the big case um, in which we expanded. We felt we needed elbow room. Um, it was made with quite big um, panels there. That, strangely enough, is Pat Woodlock, who's sitting there. <laughs> I can't remember who that is. And that was the young lady we used to have. And each one of these cabinets had a large door which slid up and down. And the whole of these cabinets were cooled by an air circulating system through a duct under the floor. And, um, water cooling went out to an outside cooling. This is the control system, of course. Um, thank you very much. I think you've finished with the slides. <coughs> thank you very much indeed. Sir. Thank you. 
origin for some of the um, ideas that came from the um, design decisions of these early computers. And um, uh, perhaps um, I think we, where the point at which I interrupted the discussion was, was that we did we mention the influence of the American scene. Um, obviously, the, the influence was very direct on Thomas Wilkes's um, uh, ideas. Tom Kilburn has already indicated that to the cost of the way he approached the design, it was um, less of an influence. Um, did the Taiwanese people have any influence? Did you see any influence from the American work on, on computers, or did they feel that they came from it? Little. In fact, we had the import on the EDSAC available while we were doing the design, um, and so we knew about the single, uh, um, single address machines and so on. But I, I think that, uh, in fact, the ideas were so much driven by Turing's concept of what the A should be, uh, that these ideas were not one of the instruments. So to that extent, the, uh, although Turing had spent some time in the USA, uh, there wasn't a very direct connection. I'm not saying that's a virtue, I think the best way it was. What was your perception, Brian? Right? Uh, well, uh, I, the, uh, there was work that went on in Philadelphia that led to the design of the ENIAC, which was a dinosaur of a machine that had 18,000 vacuum tubes. While that was being done, Eckert and Motley uh, began to realize by the application of logical principles he could do better. Uh, Eckert invented the mercury tank, the memory, and certainly Turing knew about that because there's a reference to it in a paper of his that was published much later, but written earlier. Um, they, this group was joined by Van Neumann. And out of that little group came these ideas of the stored program computer. The idea of instructions, the idea of uh, all, all, the, all these ideas we know. Uh, that, of course, um, led to a number of different kinds of machines. Machines with different numbers of addresses, parallel serial and so on. But they were all really, as I see it, based <coughs> on those ideas that came out of that group in Philadelphia. Um, who contributed what, no one will ever know. There was, some years ago, a tendency to give von Neumann all the credit, but von Neumann, no, that maybe just went wrong. Uh, Eckert, I think, had a major part of the credit, von Neumann has some, but it was from that little group that these basic ideas which then spread and led to various designs of the group to came with. I think the idea of the stored programming computer um, probably goes back further than that, though. I mean, uh, the, it was inherent in, in Turing's 1936 paper, which ah. in fact not only had, uh, 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 was a stored program computer in the sense that uh, uh, the instructions were stored and interpreted uh, in the store, I mean it was a very funny machine, uh, but to also in fact contained the idea of um, interpreting a program language, so a lot of very basic mathematical things. Now how much influence they had on later development, uh, I think is very questionable. But the, the concept is there. Well, all I can say is that anybody who thinks in the computer field now, who thinks that, the, uh, that they came from that paper, should have a look at it and have a shot. It is a highly mathematical thing. It is concerned with formula. There is no hint that it might uh, be the basis of any practical design. Uh, I would not have said that that, that, that had any way. Well, interesting um, conjecture is this, though. Uh, during uh, was working at um, the um, Institute for Advanced Studies with where uh, von Neumann was. When von Neumann first visited the ENIAC, um, he immediately made the suggestion that they should, in fact, uh, make use of the function boxes of the ENIAC to store instructions, in other words, the concept of the That's stored. Yeah, the, 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 the ENIAC had been running for oh, years. Sure, yes, 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 well, yeah. <coughs> yes, No, 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 but uh, this seems to me indicates that uh, uh, Turing must have, uh, and Turing must have had a good deal of contact with von Neumann in, in those early days. In fact, von Neumann must have been familiar with Turing's work. So it, it could be that the introduction of the idea of a stored program computer came by that route, though it's only conjecture. Well, um, I, I, knew, I knew Turing very well, and I used to speak to him quite a lot when I went to Manchester. And uh, we, we talked about this, and, and Turing at that time, told me that he'd been to see Johnny from Neumann and they discussed computer things at that time. And the suggestion was that for some idea, Johnny from Neumann, you know, uh, uh, 
hadn't been thinking, that was many, many years ago, hadn't been thinking about it beforehand. Now after this, uh, I, I think Turing's, from what he said to me in that, that Turing's design and his general idea of how a computer ought to be, that w w was it, it, his own scheme. I don't think that uh, came from America. That's my own view from, you know, talking to him quite a lot. That's going to make my point clearer. Um, I think the concept of the stored program computer is extremely clear in Turing's paper, with which I'm extremely familiar. In fact, just to give an anecdote, uh, I found a large number of errors in the actual programming of his universal computing machine, which I uh, went along to talk to him about, and found he was very uh, intolerant of anyone finding errors. was one thing for Turing to make programming errors. It wasn't a walking good programmer. Um, and in fact, some subsequent designers of the universal computing machines, like Minsky, also made errors in that program. But they were a bit more gracious about it when I pointed them out. Anyway, <laughs> the, the, the concept, I think, is there very clearly. And what is more interesting is the concept of uh, interpreting uh, the instructions of one machine uh, to make a, uh, another machine but also extremely clear in that program. What I'm not claiming, uh, and I agree with Morris here, is that this had direct influence on the post-war development of computers, except conceivably by the indirect route uh, that it must have been well known uh, to von Neumann, who I think probably uh, had first really sort of thought about stored program computers at the time when he made the suggestion uh, to the ENIAC team. That, that's only a conjecture. But the concept was there, even though it may not have had a direct uh, influence on the, uh, on, on the work of it. But you know that von Neumann made that suggestion. Well, see, the, the anecdote I, had, I heard was that uh, when von Neumann was first shown the ENIAC, uh, he uh, immediately pointed out that the function tables that they set up could be treated as instructions to save all the replugging. But this is there's no evidence. I see. Evidence, no, uh, new I, I know this is from the anecdote. Can I put the other question? I'd always got the impression, it may have been wrong, that the idea of a program was quite old, but the really essential thing was that the program could operate on itself. Now, were there not relay machines like that invented by Zuzan? You had a program. The program and the numbers that you worked on were quite distinct. Yeah. Um, the very essential, uh, yes, well, powerful idea was to make the program yeah, operate on well, itself. Well, that first appears in 1936 in children's paper. No doubt about that. Absolutely. I've been to do the paper was about medical paper and not intended to be a design of a practical machine.
so they deteriorate very badly and still work because of the special sort of techniques they use. Now I often wondered to what degree both of them, because they were different sorts, to what degree both came uh, from Bloomline, because Bloomline spent a lot of time in his day, early days uh, at uh, TRE, and I wondered if Tom Kilburn would know anything about that. Yes, uh, I think um, Fred, I, I, I became a circuit engineer. I was a mathematician reading under, undergraduate mathematics at Cambridge when I was called up and sent to TRE into F.C. Williams Group. And it was F.C. Williams who uh, converted me, or almost converted me, to becoming an engineer. Uh, and he was a great admirer of Blumlein. Uh, Blumlein was killed, wasn't he, in an accident? That's right, well. And uh, I, I have always said, I always say, uh, when I'm talking to people, that probably Freddie, Freddie Williams uh, was the best circuit designer well, after Blumlein. But I know that Blumlein, that, that Freddie Williams was a great admirer. And, right. uh, and uh, yeah. uh, there's, a, there's a direct connection there. Yeah. What I'm saying. I do know that, uh, that, that Blue Line was a lot older, of course, than Fred. Yes. A and right. uh, Blue Man went in and uh, you know, had him working for him early on in the GRE. So it seems that Fred, yes. Freddie probably got a lot from that. And yes. what you say from So What's I think that? they ought to give full marks to Blue Line. Yeah. Yes. Indeed, yes. Does that um, imply that the, uh, the, the, the effect of all the in fact, from the EMI team of which Blue Line was a part, of it, 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 that, that, that was a strong source of electronic circuit design. Yes, 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 yes. absolutely. Very it's, it's very interesting, actually. That there was another circuit called uh, an anode follower, which all of you were there you know. Uh, and we used the anode follower to uh, design as the cheapest method of designing a digital adder or subtractor. Um, and, and in order to do this, we were using the analog follower to actually sum in an analog way the input pulses. So the basis of our digital adder was in fact uh, an analog circuit yeah. called the analog follower, <laughs> which, <laughs> which I think arose from Blue Line too. Those here who may not be familiar with cathode couple or long tail pairs, of course, um, emitter coupled logic is precisely the same thing transmitted into transmitted. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly. Just in case the connection has not been shown. I'd like to make a remark about Blue Line's work, having had a fairly good look at the design of the H2S radar, which is laboratory produced. One of the stories I heard about him, uh, probably Ted can confirm this, is that he would not allow the circuit to be used if you couldn't tolerance it. And at the time, the tolerancing of circuits was a very little practiced art, but he insisted on circuits to be properly tolerance, and as a result, the H2S radar was fully tolerance, and in some cases it has to be 1% resistance in it, but um, at least to be sure that if you put the thing together with the correct combination of tolerance and components, it would work. It didn't have to fiddle with the main so there were no adjust on test components in his circuits. And I think he set the whole scene for circuit design, raised the whole level of the quality of design of circuits very considerably by his own effort. I can confirm that because I was Blue Line's boy. What I mean, uh, when he was doing all this stuff, uh, I, I, I was going to say then why things are <coughs> and all the things were going on. And in fact, after Blue Line died, I, I took over about half of the H2S stuff for the EMI. And uh, so what, what, it, uh, what was being said about this very careful function, and making circuits that you could tell that's the right. important thing. Shooting circuits, which was open to uh, analysis and uh, uh, only those sorts of circuits. In the fact, we, the circuit reserve was a very, very good example where the current was well defined by very large voltage from the system. And that was the main point of the new treatment that was about. The one thing that David, David didn't point out is that on those circuits there were voltages between plus 300 and minus 300 volts. You had to work on those while they were, uh, while they were actually working. That's good for you. The term he mentions in his paper is that you always kept one hand <laughs> away from the circuit. Yes. One hand in the pocket. One hand yeah. in the pocket. <laughs> and unearthed soldering irons. Yeah. They never switch off when I'm repairing mains things nowadays. It's trivial. <laughs> 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 well, I
we've heard an awful lot about the hardware side this afternoon. I mean, one thing that I think is very well known these days is that hardware engineering and software engineering are very different things. And software never seems to, to get to the same level of, of control and, and organization. Now, a lot of what we've heard this afternoon has shown in these last points about how good engineering principles were at the back of every single project, whatever they were doing. And this led to successful machines using very difficult uh, circumstances, difficult equipment and so on. Um, when people were doing their programming, were they applying the same care and sophistication to the way they programmed? If they were, why didn't the software develop properly in the same way? I mean, and if they were, why did they have a different business? I, I, I'd really like to, to challenge the basic uh, assumption there. What, what happens is that when machines get beyond a certain size, software doesn't catch up with it. But in, in um, the very early machines, uh, I, I, I would guess, and the only one that I know well is Pegasus, and uh, in that, I think the software was extremely sophisticated. In fact, the, the, soft, the software run models out of the hardware. And to some extent, if you look at the, uh, some of the early personal computers where the constraints are very tight and very similar, you see some of the same things happening again. And then when the machine gets beyond a certain size, the combinatorial explosion takes over and a number of things you can do. And it's impossible for the software to keep up. But it's really the other way around. On a very, a very tightly constrained piece of hardware, then you see much more nearly optimized software. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the actual hardware introduced a new discipline of software, didn't it? So there was no background of software as such before these machines existed. So the software had to evolve, whereas the hardware already existed. So it was configured in a different way. Sure. I did that as well, but, it had, but, but on a very small machine, you fill up the software possibilities quite quickly, and even if you have a great tradition of software on a very large machine, you never will. I remember the software so in order to make a point of that. Huh? Maybe weird. Oh. Well, I wasn't quite sure about this. I mean, in the early days, uh, hardware, uh, people talk about individuals uh, actually making it. There's a large number of circuits working together, and many interaction problems that have to be solved using the hardware. They turned up and they were solved. In the same place, the same things took place with software that as programs grew, there were more interactions possible and they were solved. I don't think there's any real difference between the two displays. Um, I should point out also that uh, on the hardware, you only see the survivors. There were a fair number of projects of that era which are not represented here today for various reasons. <laughs> How about an assertion that hardware scales up better than software? Uh, I, I think it's a bit... I would deny that. I mean, the hardware scaling up nowadays relies on software. So the software has to work as well as the hardware. Oh, yeah, they both have to work. Uh, I, I think the, the software is... The early software was much more sophisticated than people think. Because, of course, what we had to do in those days were, were all our codes <coughs> and there were numbers. I mean, there was no, no helping about that. But we started getting quite sophisticated about subroutines. And we did very hierarchical sorts of ways of doing things. So, for instance, when, when these cards were getting together to do different things, you'd have a little subroutine, then you'd have a higher level subroutine and a higher level, level subroutine. And some of these systems that were worked out for doing matrix works and things like that were really very sophisticated and, and uh, worked extremely well in a hierarchical sort, sort of way. But I think when uh, high-level languages came into being, that they, they came into being rather uh, in a way to try and make things easier for people and not to make them more sophisticated in engineering life. Yes, I, I speak with some experience. Speak. Roger Scantlebury. Um, I was uh, part of the time working on, on the ACE computer, and I remember servicing the machine with Jim Wilkinson standing over me 
and uh, one of the tests, uh, we would run a series of tests on the machine, uh, software programs written to test the machine, but it was a pretty poor machine that couldn't pass its own test programs. So as a final test, we would run one of Jim Wilkinson's big matrix programs, and if it ran that and got it right, then it was a good machine, and if it didn't, it wasn't a good machine, and that was the, that was the acid test. So the hardware was actually being tested by a sophisticated software which was known to work. But there was a small rider to that, which one day the thing wouldn't pass this particular program. And therefore Jim swore there was something wrong with the machine. He swore there was a bug in it, and we couldn't find this bug. And eventually, uh, we actually reproduced his, his pack of cards and ran it on a new pack of cards, and it still wouldn't pass the program. So I wound up by taking every single card, one by one, and comparing the lace pattern that Donald's spoken about on these Hollerith cards, until I found one card that had got one bit different. And when I found that card, I looked at the bit, and it was a chad that uh, Wilkinson had put back into the hole, <laughs> and had then pushed into the hole with a pencil. And the, the, the pencil lead was, was conducting through on the, on, on the reading strip, so the bug was actually in the card. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is now um, time for questions. Yeah. Um, brief mention has been made of uh, margin testing on machines. And I feel that's a very important point uh, the present day equipment lost sight of. Um, on the ACE, for instance, we've got um, test programs like the one Roger just mentioned, and run to give uh, confidence in use. And you have one master switch on the control disk that can change all the biases up and down every stage of the machine. If that failed, but then subdivided, you can do the same test on each frame. And if you found the frame where the fault was, you could subdivide again and do it on each chassis. <coughs> Very powerful test that ends up a fault diagnosis and confidence boosting. And present day technology seems to have lost sight of that. Uh, you know, yeah. so, so, come back to my mind. Today's technology is slightly doesn't work in the same way. When marginal testing is, I believe, is going to, to, to catch the valve, it's gone beyond the limits. This is what it might be with the pegs. But you don't get the, fortunately, you don't get the same type of deterioration in the semiconductor device. You don't now, anyway. Right, well, I think we should uh, draw it to half past five, and we should uh, draw that draw it to a close. Um, I've, I've found it to be absolutely fascinating, and I'm sure you, you all have as well. And what I would like to 